I'm talking today with Jason Pace, Executive Director for the Center for Serious Play at the University of Washington Bothell. Jason, in your article, The Ways We Play, you talk about how different platforms and interfaces influence the kinds of video games developers create. Can you give us some examples of what you mean? Sure. If you think about it, um, going back even to pre-computer games, when we're talking about tabletop games, obviously those kinds of interfaces, you have cards or you have small pieces or you have a board, influences the kind of game that you create because you move pieces in certain ways and you interact with the game world in a certain way. Similarly with video games, whether you're playing on a PC with a mouse or keyboard or whether you're playing on a console or a touch device, the way that you interact with that machine is going to influence the kind of games you create. So you can imagine Imagine that if you have access to a mouse and keyboard, you can do a lot of things very quickly and very precisely. For example, if you're playing a real-time strategy game, you may need to control hundreds of units on the screen at the same time and move very quickly and very precisely between them. However, if you're playing on a large screen television with a console controller where you have analog thumbsticks, that's frequently much less precise and the kinds of games that you make will take advantage of that particular form factor. So you'll see things like platformer games, you see things like driving games or fighting games that initially became very popular on that particular platform. So why did PC games seem to get all the attention in the 1990s? Well, early on, certainly in the 80s, uh, PCs weren't really in a lot of households. They weren't a common consumer device until the 90s started to, to really get underway. At that time, we started to really begin taking for granted that people would just have a PC in their homes. And as a result of that, PC development and PC advances started happening much more quickly. The, the release cycles and the development cycles were shortened to months instead of years. So whereas consoles would tend to ship and then stay around for a few years and not advance, PC developments were changing month by month sometimes in many cases. And so the power between 1990 and say 1995 of your average PC greatly eclipsed the raw power of the consoles at that time. And so the kinds of experiences you could create, the kinds of games you could create were much more intense, much more exciting. Developers were really taking advantage of the additional RAM and additional processors and then the advent of, of dedicated 3D hardware allowed you to create really exciting and really rich experiences. But that didn't last into the 2000s, right? Well, part of what happened, uh, the downside, I guess, to that explosion in the PC market was that heterogeneity increased dramatically during this time. And by heterogeneity, I mean everyone had a completely different configuration in their PCs. There were different processors and different amounts of RAM and different video cards. And so as a result, the test matrices for these games became incredibly burdensome for developers. And so whereas you would only need to develop for one set of hardware if you were developing for a console, you would need to potentially develop for hundreds and test for hundreds of different configurations if you were making a PC game. And then there were also lots of confusion among consumers around what kind of drivers they need and how they needed to update their systems to work with the latest game technologies. And so Nintendo, Microsoft with Xbox One, and Sony saw this, and they released hardware that was powerful enough to do really graphically interesting things, but then also was just that one box, and that was part of their value proposition to developers, was whereas you need to do all of this testing for PCs, you only need to do uh, once for, for consoles. There was another really interesting thing happening um, in the early 2000s, and that was the explosion of television screen technology. Whereas in the 80s and early part of the 90s, and throughout most of the 90s, mostly people had something like a 20-inch television. Uh, in the 2000s, we really started to see large screen displays, rear projection TVs, front projection TVs, and then as the decade progressed, large screen flat panel displays in high definition, and that had a dramatic impact on the ability to create really immersive, very cinematic experiences for consoles. But we're seeing a resurgence with PC gaming today. Yeah, it's very interesting. The pendulum is swinging once again, um, or in at least move, the needle is moving again. Um, and console development has, because it became such a spectacular cinematic undertaking, the budgets required to produce these AAA titles spiraled into the tens of millions of dollars, sometimes approaching $100 million. And it became very difficult for many smaller developers to get a foothold and actually be able to be seen in this very crowded market 
with lots of uh, very big players. And so on the PC side, we saw some really interesting things happening with social games with Facebook and Zynga, for example. And we also see saw a resurgence of independent developers who were shipping on new distribution platforms like Valve Steam. And so there were some really interesting reclaiming, I think, of PC space that had been lost in the previous decade. And also there was still a market, of course, for, for the higher end games that were really pushing the, the most current hardware. Because even though Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 are very powerful machines, they certainly can't keep up with and match the rapid development cycles of PCs. So there's still a very big market um, for, for games that really push the envelope in terms of hardware and processing power. And finally, games like World of Warcraft, massively multiplayer games, have really established themselves as not really going anywhere in the immediate future. There are millions of people playing those games. And so I think we're entering a time where where, where we're starting to see a niche carved out for everyone instead of these dramatic shifts from one or another. Are mobile games starting to have an impact? Absolutely. Mobile games play into this new conversation where it's no longer really an either-or situation, but an and. Mobile games because of the form factor, because the screens tend to be much smaller and the touch input is, is very different in many ways than either a mouse and keyboard or a controller, it's not really an either-or situation. Whereas you could make arguments in the past that uh, initially in the 90s PCs were eclipsing consoles in terms of power and then in the 2000s consoles were eclipsing PCs in terms of display size and sort of being able to sit on the sofa with your friends. There's nothing really about mobile that's eclipsing the kind of experience you get on PCs or consoles. However, it does give you the opportunity to play a game for a few minutes if you're on the bus or if you are between meetings or if you just have a few minutes at home. And that's really interesting because the kinds of games that you develop now and the kinds of games that are shipping on mobile devices are very much tuned for that five or ten minute experience instead of the hour or longer experience you usually see on consoles. And so one of the unique factors that's arisen out of this is that the demographics of mobile gaming are very different. Whereas consoles are perceived generally as being primarily male-dominated, there's no such male domination necessarily in mobile devices. The kinds of games that are available are appealing to a wide range of audiences, both men and women, young and old. And the lower price points of mobile devices make people much more willing to just give it a try. And if they don't like it, it's 99 cents or $1.99. It's not a big deal. Do you have any thoughts on what's likely to change in the next few years? I think following on the conversation that we're no longer in an either-or place where we're shifting either between consoles or PCs, but rather embracing a lot of different models where there are things I like to do on consoles, there are things I like to do on PCs, things I like to do on my mobile device, I think we're moving into a world where there will be lots more diversity of experiences, lots more opportunity for new demographics to participate in games, which is great. Um, and I think that, that emergent behaviors like two-screen behaviors, where you're sitting on your sofa and you're using your iPad or your, or your tablet device in concert with your console um, as an adjunct device, similar to Xbox Smart Glass or something like the Wii U, where you have a dedicated touchscreen controller, I think we're really moving into a world where we're experimenting with lots of different screens, lots of different technologies, and uh, it's really just an exciting time. As games proliferate even more through our daily lives and game-like experiences become more common, I think we're really just only going to, to move into a world of greater opportunity and greater diversity. Thank you very much. Thank you.